Welcome to Tequila and Terror, a paranormal and true crime podcast where we will drink tequila and tell terrible tales. My name is Keisha and I will be telling paranormal stories and Wes will cover true crime. How's it going everybody? Welcome to ep- episode six. Episode six. Uh, we're pretty sure it's episode six. <laughs> we we have consumed booze six. once again. <laughs> so sorry, guys. It's, it's bad. just gonna go downhill from yeah. here. It's fine. But it's okay. Thanks for listening. If you still are, I we guess you really are. appreciate you yeah. all. And to the people in Australia, that no sarcasm, that's really awesome. Yeah, we thought that was pretty cool. We usually have a midweek slump, and the people in Australia completely blew the slump away. So <laughs> They were slump defeaters. Yeah, so... Slump battles. The, that was awesome. I, I like Australia. Maybe we can do an all-Australian episode one time. Like, I could find mm-hmm. an Australian killer, and you could probably find an Australian ghost. Yeah, or a couple. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, that's cool, but thanks. All right, well. What do you have for us today, Keisha? uh, This week, we're talking about a place that you and I have tried to visit multiple times. Mm, The Waverly Hills? Waverly Hills. Yeah, I figured that since it's been such a tough route trying to get there for us, that I might as well just go ahead and cover it. Cool. Uh, Waverly Hills originally was owned by Major Thomas H. Hayes. The land on which Waverly Hills was eventually built housed Hayes' family home and a schoolhouse. Uh, It is stated that much of the land was acquired from Major Hayes in 1908, but there is no record of who did the transaction or how the transaction took place. As you may know, during the 1800s and 1900s, tuberculosis also known as the White Death or Consumption. Consumption. Again, not from food. It just makes me want nachos. (laughs) Consumption. Makes you want cake. Or cake. Or any of the foods. (laughs) Uh, Consumption was rampant in America. Could you imagine if we got sponsored by zebra cakes? God, we would be the worst humans I would weigh 600 pounds and just sit here and walk in my own filth and talk about killers. And eat zebra cakes. <laughs> that would be awful. That'd Please be a don't. good commercial. <laughs> hey, Hostess, if you're listening, oh, look us up. Is that even a Hostess product? Uh, whatever brand you are, you know okay. who you are, people. You know who you are. And All milk. right. Sorry. It's okay. We, we got this. Zebra cakes. Mm-hmm. Uh, zebra cakes were rampant in America, apparently. Th- these are the only laughs we're going to get from this episode. In the early 1900s. My story is horrible. So. Um. So. In 1900, Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville? Louisville. I always say Louisville. It's not Louisville. Oh. It's Louisville, I think is how they pronounce it. We say Louisville because we're awful. Louisville, Kentucky had one of the highest death rates in America from tuberculo- tuberculosis. They also have a lot of whiskey. They Now they do, not then. Oh. That's... In 1910... A hospital was constructed in Jefferson County on the land so shadily acquired in hopes to battle the disease. The hospital was built on low swamp land, which is, you know, the best conditions for disease to breed and spread. So that was already something going for them. Nothing like a hot and humid yeah. swamp to have a hospital. It's awesome. It's so good. Um, the original hospital only housed 40 beds and was soon overcrowded. Because, like I said, like these people had the highest rate. Uh, they soon added a wing on, intended to house those who were the sickest, and eventually added a 40-bed children's area as well as a school. In 1926, an entirely new, more modernized building was erected on the grounds with hundreds of beds. Medical staff lived on site, devoting their lives to curing tuberculosis. Hmm. So, since medical staff lived there, they weren't allowed to leave because, obviously, you know, there were chances of it spreading. The grounds... Grounds? The grounds? The grounds housed, is what I was trying oh. to say. The grounds housed the hospital as well as a post office, barbershop, school, dentist, among other things. So, it was basically a one-stop shop, like, self-contained city. Hmm. So, you never have to leave for zebra cakes. No. It's cool. You were really trying for a zebra cake sponsorship, yep. aren't you? <laughs> oh, heavens. Bye, little Debbie. 
Oh, babe. Okay. So, at this time, Waverly Hills was considered the most advanced sanatorium in the country. Uh, during the time, they believed that fresh air and plenty of rest and nutrient-rich foods would help the patients rid themselves of the disease. So advanced. Yeah. So, experiments were conducted in search of a cure since obviously healthy food and fresh air was not helping anyone. Uh, they would expose the patient's lungs to ultraviolet light to stop the spread of bacteria by putting the patient in sunrooms using artificial light. So basically they would just like keep them in a room with the light on constantly. They would Mm. not let them have any darkness or they would put them on the roof or on open porches. Uh, Since fresh air was considered a cure Patients were placed on the porches or in front of windows, no matter what season, which I'm sure only aided in the growth of the bacteria in their lungs. Yeah, especially you know, during the summer in the south. In the swamp land. Yeah, all the mosquitoes. they, um, unfortunately, this is not funny. Uh, there are actually pictures of patients hanging out in chairs covered in snow receiving their quote-unquote treatment. Hmm. So it didn't matter how the weather was, if it was raining, if it was snowing, they were out there receiving their quote unquote treatment and during these terrible conditions, probably making them even sicker. Yeah, that's probably getting pneumonia. And- it's awful. Like their lungs are already crappy enough. Come on. But it was a different time. Pretty sure that's one of our uh, catchphrases at this point yeah always, it was a different time i confuse leprosy and tuberculosis for some reason all the time i know they're nothing <laughs> alike but <laughs> those are completely different yeah. things babe. but they put no. them both in there was always leper colonies and tuberculosis hospitals okay i know well, lepers skins fall off i think lepers are like in the bible too See, I'd have to read that first, I guess. Yeah, you need to work on yeah. that whole religion thing. Um, but I think there was a leper colony in Hawaii. Okay, well, let's not... Let's let's delve into that later. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we'll do some more research before yeah. we know about lepers, because I know nothing. Um, okay. So, they would hang out in chairs on these sun porches or the roof or wherever. They also would place heavy sandbags on patients' chest to see if it would help. No. Why? 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 I am not the tuberculosis doctor, but I'm going to say that the answer is no. I have no idea. These people are crazy. Um, Other worse treatments, because, you know, it gets worse than having to sit in the snow and have a sandbag put on your chest. That's like an old witch test thing where they just put weights on your chest. Yeah. Yeah. So, they include surgical implantation of balloons into the lungs Hmm. that would then be filled with air to expand the lung, which is hella dangerous. Um, And then often fatal surgical removal of muscles and ribs from the chest to allow the lungs to expand further. Which, again, why? Why? Wow. That's pretty crazy. Uh, Most of the patients ended up leaving through the body chute rather than through the front door. The body chute? The body chute. Okay. So the body chute was an enclosed tunnel that was actually used by staff to receive supplies in the winter when the weather conditions conditions proved harsh. Kind of like, you know, weather today across much of America. Mm. It's awful. Um, (laughs) So the... Tunnel went from the hospital to the railroad tracks at the bottom of the hill. And I'm sure you guys can't see my little hand motion that I just made making a hill, but it's like I an did. S shape. Yeah, it's a little hill. Uh, they used kind of like a roller coaster they put dead bodies on. Ki- kind of. We're about to get there. Was there um, a loop? No, there's no loop to loop. Oh. <laughs> they used a motorized rail and cable system. And it is said that the staff used this to secretly lower bodies down to waiting trains so that patients did not see the corpses leave and have to endure the mental turmoil that would likely come from seeing others pass away from the condition that they had. That would do it because I think I remember seeing like 37,000 people or something died there. Um, Okay. So that is false. I didn't write this down, but it is said that it wasn't 37,000. Like at the height, I think it was like 
oh, don't get me lying, maybe a hundred a day. That's a lot. But it wasn't like thirty seven thousand. It was like maybe again, I'm probably lying about the actual number, but it was like maybe eight thousand. Oh, I mean, that's it's still, still a lot. lot. It's a lot of dead bodies, but not as many. Mm. Because that was like at the absolute height, the most people who paid, who died in a day was like 137. But having to dispose of 100 bodies a day. Yeah. If people just see a constant stream of bodies go by, that would kind yeah. of put a... And it's uh, said that the doctors basically told the nurses, hey, this is the way we're going to do this because their physical health and their mental health are equally as important. Like, hmm. they need to be mentally strong if they're going to be this physically ill. And we have to put a loop in the body shoot coaster just to up their morale a little bit. Oh, my God. After they're already dead. <laughs> hey. Up the morale of the nurses who Can have you to imagine push them down like there. A, a camera pointed on a deal taking your picture <laughs> at the end of the ride? Oh, my God. You were awful. Oh, my God. Okay. Let me find where I'm at because now I'm completely lost. <laughs> At the loop in body shoot. <laughs> loop in body shoot. Okay. Yes. Uh, by the ni- late 1930s, tuberculosis cases started to fade. And by 1943, medications had been created that helped eradicate the disease. Hmm. Waverly Hills closed for the first time in 1961. And then the following year reopened as Wood- Woodhaven Geriatric Sanitarium. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's rumored... That many of the patients were mistreated and experimented on during the time that Woodhaven was open. Um, some of the rumors were true. Some of them were just rumors. But it has been proven that uh, the sanitarium did use electric shock therapy on the seniors to treat Alzheimer's and dementia. And it said that some even died from this. Hmm. Which sucks. I feel really bad for old people. Yeah, but... I mean, they're elderly. They've been through a lot already. Just get, cut them some slack. And you're going to go through a little bit more, it seems. Yeah. Okay. So, in 1982, the state closed the facility for the last time. The building changed hands multiple times. Uh, one developer had plans to turn in the property into a minimum security prison, but the neighbors were like, no. No, no we've no, already no. seen enough stuff go down here. <laughs> no. Keep your prison. Yeah. Um, so, the next wanted to turn it into apartments. I would stay there. I'm okay with that. I mean, yeah, we would. Um, And then the next wanted to basically build a mega church and create the world's (laughs) largest statue of Jesus on top of the hospital. (laughs) What? Um, Inspired by the one in Rio de Janeiro, de Janeiro, however you say that. Kind of like the one in the Christ of the Ozarks, but like bigger. Um, Yeah. He (laughs) He wanted to build a chapel theater and gift shop as of well course, as this you gotta have a gift really shop. large jesus see our big old jesus up here in the hills of louisville listen the higher the hair the closer to god the higher the jesus the closer to god i guess yeah, i don't really know all the way up there oh yeah if a I pentecostal mean, be... woman got on top of jesus that's all the way to heaven <laughs> all the way to heaven um, would so, Jesus have like an observation deck in his head so you get Oh my out? God, that would be so cool. Or on like his hand that way you can be in. Eyes? Oh, that's a good <laughs> idea. I would say if they had it in his hand, you could be in like the hand of Jesus. Oh, that okay. We need to stop dreaming about that because we're going to create like a whole new thing. I kind of want to go to a Jesus statue you now that has laser eyes. I don't think any of them have laser eyes, but we'll do some more research on that later. Okay. If you know of a Jesus statue that has laser eyes. Hit your girl up. I'm the one who does the social media, so it's me. Hi. Um, So funding for this one fell short as it was estimated to cost about $12 million. And in a year's time, they only raised about (laughs) $3,000. That's like some of our fundraising right there. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, guys, I'm going to build this big old Jesus in the hills. Give me all your money. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So there's that. Um, and I can't use my computer. I'm sorry. I'm broken. I'm broken. Um, the property was eventually bought by Charlie and Tina Mattingly, who are the current owners. Hmm. Um, they have a goal of restoring and preserving the old sanatorium. They host paranormal tours on the property and even have a laser light show on the outside of the building at Christmas time. I know we missed it. I totally was going to... Like, I was sick all of last month, so I'm sorry. We'll do it next year. 
this year. This year. It's January. Some year. We'll do it eventually. <clears throat> we'll go. All right. And it's ghost time. Super special ghost time. Mm-hmm. I don't know where that came from. <clears throat> Alcohol okay. is its name Oh. <laughs> it is. Okay. So it said that the majority of the paranormal activity on the property happens on the fifth floor. It said two nurses committed suicide in room 502, one of which hanged herself, hanged or hung, one of which hanged herself, we're going to go with that one, on a light fixture or exposed pipe upon finding out she was pregnant. It said that she was unmarried and had gotten pregnant by one of the doctors or administrators of the facility who was married and didn't plan to leave his wife. Hmm. Uh, Another nurse is said to have jumped from the patio on the roof and plunged to her death. Some claim she was pushed, not punched, uh, but there was no records to tell us which is true. For our stories (laughs) to be so alike and us not talk about them, they are also so similar. I mean, wait. (laughs) Alcohol derailed my (laughs) thought halfway through that. For our stories to not <laughs> us talk about, I can't make words. Considering we don't discuss our stories prior to yeah. recording, apparently they're similar. I still don't know yeah. his yet, so we'll see. Caveman says story a lot. <laughs> okay, caveman, calm it down over there, buddy. All right. Uh, visitors claim that they have heard disembodied voices starting stating to get out on this floor and claim they have seen shapes moving in the windows, which plays in later. Hmm. So just remember that, y'all. Shapes and windows. Yeah. Uh, the legend of the man in the white coat um, comes alive here. Hi. Hi. man in the white coat. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, people have reported seeing a man in a white coat walking in the kitchen as the smell of food wafts through the room. Hmm. What uh, kind of food? We're about to get to that. Ooh. So Hope investigators have claimed that they could smell bread baking in the kitchen when it is obviously not a functioning kitchen anymore. Wow. Yeah. Hasn't been functioning for years. They smell bread. Could that be residual stuff? Yeah. From the kitchen and the walls? Or? Yeah. Yeah, it could. Um, and like residual energy and all of that. Oh, I was thinking like physical, like over time. I mean, it's been like... A whole, but I can't math, but a whole bunch of years. At least, at least this many years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just put up hands. Yeah. Just, just put up hands. Our calculations um, show that it's been this many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the death tunnel. Hmm? Dun, dun, dun. Is supposedly a paranormal hotspot, commonly providing EVPs for investigators, as well as Im- disembodied voices, footsteps, and shadows. So I would say I would say that that would be a haunted place. Yeah, um, there is the ghost of a small child. They call him Timmy. Timmy, who is said to be six or seven year years old, um, who passed at Waverly Hills. Uh, people will bring toy balls with them when visiting and invite Timmy to play with them. And many people have reported instances where the ball has moved on its own, completely untouched. I've seen some videos of that. You and I watched BuzzFeed Unsolved Paranormal yeah. episode where Ryan Bergara and the other dude, Shane, yeah. went and they rolled the ball and like it rolled back to them and all of a sudden it rolled right under the name Ryan. Which I thought was cool, but dude was like, no, the floor's uneven. But, you know, I mean, there are instances. Yeah. Some of that stuff can look like an optical illusion. Like the floor may be unlevel, but look level because of the way the walls are. So Mm -hmm. if you put the ball on the floor, it's going to look like it's rolling towards you because the floor is actually unlevel. With it being open air like that a lot of the times... That's also something that comes into play because there are so many, like, of those sun porches. If you Google Waverly Hills, I'm sure I'll post a picture on our social media as well. But you can tell, like, there are these big open spaces. If windows are open, it creates kind of a wind tunnel. I remember seeing on you know. the old Ghost Hunters what had Jason and Grant. I don't mm-hmm. know if you talk about this in the story or not. No. But they had a video through of a ther- thermal camera that... Uh, it. I still think it was BS, but it was pretty interesting. Yeah. 
Um, I wish that show would get on Hulu or something. That would be awesome. Uh, the fourth floor is popular for the amount of apparitions that have been seen here. Sometimes they appear full-bodied and sometimes just appear as a pair of eyes. That's creepy. I don't like that. I would rather you just like be disembodied feet or like disembodied hands. Do not just show up as a pair of eyes. Hmm. That is creepy as hell. Yeah. Uh, visitors claim to have been touched and even pushed by ghosts on the property. There have also been claims that visitors have experienced hearing moans as well as doors slamming <laughs> shut. Not like sexual oh. moans, like those of people dying from tuberculosis. Oh, okay. that makes more sense. Like That's... groany moans, groans, not, not like moans. not like sexual moans. Oh, okay. God bless. <laughs> oh heavens. Okay. Um, door slamming shut and have even seen footsteps suddenly appear in puddles, which I'm not sure if that means that they're like appearing coming from the puddles, like walking out of the puddle, hmm. or if they're like random foot indentations in pools of water, like Jesus walking on the water. Hmm. I don't know if you know anything about Jesus walking on the water, but I know he turns water into wine. Okay. Well, that's all you need to know, buddy. All right. And... There is even claims that a grim presence, some call the creeper. The grim creeper? J- maybe. Uh, is said to be different from all of the other spirits on the property. Stated to carry an aura of doom and rarely is seen. This inhuman spider-like entity is said to follow those who experience it around crawling. What the hell? Ghost crawling, spider? Crawling on the walls and the ceilings, which is where I said would come into play later. I want to see yeah. that thing. Yeah. It it's I tried to find a picture. If you guys find a picture or video of this, please send it to me. I was strapped for a time and I looked as much as possible. There are like, none because it's not I, real. Yeah, I know. I really tried to find it though cuz mm. I was super into it. Um it you, was exciting. Yeah. You can make up whatever kind of ghost. We're, I mean, we can, we're like going to go there and say there's a ghost of an elephant right? in there. Anyway, so Waverly Hills actually does tours now. Yes. And overnight investigations. Um, they do tours that are like an hour and a half to two hours, Friday and Saturday nights. They also do public investigation or public paranormal investigations that are like six hours and eight hours. Uh, historical guided tours on Sundays. So if you get a chance, They're go. Really hard to take book, pictures though. and video. EVPs, if you get them, tag us in them because we're super excited about this. Post it to all your social media and show us. We tried to book one about three months in advance and it didn't happen. Yeah, it was awful. But we'll get it eventually. Yeah. We'll go. All right, babe. So what um, terrible, horrible, disgusting thing are you talking about? First, I have some breaking news. Do you? It turns out that zebra cakes are made by Little Debbie. What? Yeah, so little Debbie, if you're listening, send some our way. Yes, please. Yeah. Also, wait. Are we? No, okay. We'll do the drink at the the end of the night. Yeah. Okay, cool. Because <laughs> we're gonna need a palate cleanser after this. Okay. One. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. We got this. Uh, a lot of this story is from a journal that the lady named uh, Christine Marie Riggs kept in prison, and I also found a lot. Uh about it from an online law journal. This case happened in Arkansas. It started in Oklahoma and moved in Arkansas. So that's how I heard a lot about it. It was a lot. It was no local news. But. Not to triangulate our location or anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty easy to find out where we're from. All you gotta do is search for the name of the show when our names pop up. Oh, so yeah. I forgot about that. It's not too hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I'm sorry because there's pretty much no humor in this story. And uh, it involves young children, so if you're sensitive to that, I'd probably just go ahead and stop listening now. Yeah, fast forward to the last, like, four minutes where you can hear all of our social media and me talk about my drink. Or if you just want to pretend like we did that already. I don't know. Okay, go. Yeah, we're (laughs) going to go ahead and do it and see how it goes. Because... My research showed that more people wanted to know more details. Okay. Instead of speedy, so. Give me all the details then. Okay. Then. Then I do. There I go, being more Southern. Yeah. But Christine Riggs lived most of her life in Oklahoma City. 
Her stepbrother sexually abused her from age 7 to 13. Oh, poor baby. At 13, she was also abused by a neighbor. Within a year, she began drinking, smoking, and she said no boys liked her because of her weight. So she became sexually promiscuous at the age of 13. Poor girl. She thought it was the only way she could have a boyfriend. By the age of 16, she was pregnant. And in January of 1988, she gave birth to a baby boy. Mm. But they put that baby up for adoption. I mean, it's probably for the best. Yeah. But She goes on to finish high school and became a LPN, a licensed practical nurse. So she's doing pretty good for herself. Yeah, she's good. Point. I she, mean, to this point. Yeah. She worked part-time at uh, a local nursing home and full-time at a veterans hospital. So she was a worker. Yeah. After dating several men, including a sailor and a bar bouncer, Riggs began a relationship with Timothy Thompson, who was stationed at Tinker Air Force Base. In 1991, she learned that she was pregnant. She told Thompson about the baby the day before he was discharged for service. Oh, my God. Thompson at first wouldn't accept the baby as his own, so he moved back home, left her alone. So she rekindled a relationship with a with a sailor named John Riggs. She said that that relationship was great. He he treated the baby like it was his own baby. That baby Justin was born June seventh, nineteen ninety two. Riggs, Christina Riggs, she wrote, As I held Justin in my arms and looked into his little face, I became so scared. Would I be a good mom? John eventually moved in with her, but the relationship was troubled from the start. She was pregnant again, and on their wedding night in 1993, she miscarried the baby. Oh, no. So we've done stories about this before, how miscarriages and stuff like that really have an effect on a woman's mental health oh yeah the marriage teetered on the verge of divorce Riggs said she became depressed and suicidal she was she was prescribed birth control and the doctor prescribed her antidepressant she said she started feeling better and she stopped taking the drug i don't know what birth control does mentally but i thought that was odd they included that maybe it had some kind of reaction with the prozac i Um, don't really I don't really know. I mean, it'll help. It depends on what kind of birth control. I think it definitely helps regulate your hormones at times. That's what I was saying. Maybe um, that's Which would help with your emotions on like a non, like on a different level than the Prozac. Um, Prozac will help with like mental stability and like it. (sighs) Mental health is difficult to explain, but yeah, I mean. It's a different situation completely. Uh, Plus, I'm sure they probably thought that she needed to be in a better place prior to her getting pregnant again. Yeah. Um, you know, get her well. Yeah. Her mother, Carol, said that her daughter confided in her about her depression, but minimized its effect. So she told her mom that she was depressed, but said, really, just shuck it off as nothing. What Which she would I, do. You don't want to tell like, people about your... Yeah. yeah, I don't talk about mine. Like, Except, I mean, I talk about mine openly, yeah. but I don't tell everybody all the gore- gory details. So. But Riggs became pregnant again, and in in December, she gave birth to a girl, Shelby Alexis Riggs. Mm. Riggs wrote in a journal, we were so happy. She was so beautiful. I didn't think it could get any better. Mm. She said her husband was full of so much love for her. In 1995... Riggs said that the hospital assigned her to work at Triage, just a short distance away from the Oklahoma City Murrah Federal Building, where Timothy McVeigh bombed it. Oh, crap. So she said from that, she suffered post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. Which I could see where that would happen. Anybody would. Yeah, that's got to be awful. There was a daycare in the bottom floor of that, and a lot of kids were killed. Oh, so. no. Uh, Holy crap, I didn't think about that. And being a mom, I'm sure that hit her twice as hard because she was thinking about not only, like, all of these people, too, but, like, what if this happened to my own kids? Yeah. God bless. 
In the summer of 95, the couple decided to move to Sherwood, Arkansas, where her mother was living. Okay. The, they hoped that her mom would help them with daycare. Riggs got a job at the local hospital where her mom worked. Both children had health problems. She said the girl Shelby had a lot of serious ear infections, and Justin had ADD and hyperactivity. Same. Said that that made him a handful. The marriage between John and Christina was struggled. John finally moved back to local Oklahoma City after he punched a child. What? Yeah. Oh my God, who would punch a child? Well, John Him? punched Justin in the stomach so hard that he required medical attention. Oh, poor baby. According to court documents, Justin was crushed by this. Justin would say, my daddy hurt me, and then he went away. From then on, Riggs' financial circumstances got way worse. Child support payments from John were pretty much non-existent. Yeah. She worked long hours at this new job at Arkansas Heart Hospital and as a temporary at a nursing agency. Her bills mounted. She said in an interview, The more you work, the more you need daycare. Then you feel bad about having to leave them in daycare. She said she dropped off her daughter at the daycare for the first time, and the child cried as the mom went away. Riggs started getting behind on her bills because she was having to pay all this money for daycare. She wasn't making a lot of money, especially being a single mom. It was really straining her. Yeah, going from a two-income household to a one-income household, I'm sure, yeah. is a huge difference. So she wrote some hot checks. Her car registration expired. She realized she was going under. She said, I started out in a boat with a small hole. But the hole kept getting bigger, and no matter matter how hard you bail, you just kept sinking. I was tired. I gave up. Suicide seemed like the only thing. Her mother said she sensed something wrong about her. But when she asked, her daughter said, I was just tired. I'm working too many hours. Well, I'm sure it's easy to become... You're prideful at a point like that. You don't want to tell anybody that you're in over your head because then... That's admitting defeat, too. You know? Yeah. On November 4th, 1997, Riggs gathered drugs from her her job. She took the painkiller morphine and potassium chloride from the heart hospital where she worked. Okay. She also took needles, syringes. And her doctor had prescribed her an antidepressant named... Uh, Ellaville. Mm -hmm. So she had that. And on the night of November 4th, 1997, let me make sure, yeah, make sure I have those dates right. About 10 p.m., Riggs gave the children the Ellaville she had mixed with water and made the children drink it. Ellaville is a sedative that put them to sleep. She then placed the children in their beds. So. She then injected Justin in the neck with undiluted potassium chloride, oh. a drug that is used in open heart surgery to stop the heart from beating. But if it's not diluted, the drug causes extreme pain and burning sensation. Oh, no. So Justin woke up and cried out in terror. Oh, no. So he's in a lot of pain at this point. She takes the morphine and tries to inject him with morphine to quiet him down. Had no effect. So she, he continues crying. She takes his pillow and smothers him to death. Oh my God, poor baby. Then she goes over to her, her daughter's bed. She decided not to use the potassium chloride because the pain had just caused her son. Yeah. So she suffocated her daughter with a pillow. She then placed both the children side by side in her bed and covered them with a blanket. Who does that? She then wrote a suicide note to her mother and her ex-husband. The note said, I hope one day you will forgive me for taking my life and the life of my children, but I can't live like this anymore. I couldn't bear to leave my children behind to be a burden on you or to be separated and raised apart from their fathers and live knowing their mother killed herself. Yeah. She then took 28 of the antidepressants, normally a lethal dose, and, then, and it injected herself with enough undiluted potassium chloride to kill five people. Oh, my God. The antidepressant took effect, and she fell unconscious on the floor. 
the potassium chloride burned a hole in her arm as big as a silver dollar. Ooh, ow. Mm-mm, yeah. Mm-mm. So that stuff really messes up your veins. It's just yeah. all that happened by in less than 30 minutes, Ooh. pretty much. So the next day, Riggs didn't show up for work because she worked with her mom at the hospital. Yeah. So after her mom got off, at this point, she probably got off at four or five. It's probably been at least 16 hours later or whatever. Yeah. Her mom calls. She's not getting a response. So she drives over to the house. Mm-hmm. She knocked on the door, didn't get anything. She So she let herself in. She goes in. She finds the children and what she thought was Christine was dead. She said, all I could do was turn around, scream, and holler. She said there was no way to describe how she felt. She called 911 and said, my daughter and her babies are dead. Paramedics and police found Riggs barely alive and took her to the hospital nearby in North Little Rock. How did she survive through that? I don't don't know. That is insane. Yeah. that. That is so much. Like, that trauma, I can't even imagine. really surprised me that she survived. Oh, my God. Doctor stabilized Riggs and pumped her stomach and moved her into intensive care. Uh, While she was at the hospital getting treatment, the police were at her house searching. That's where they found the syringes and the suicide notes. Of course, yeah. So they, they decided to keep her under guard. They, the police weren't letting anybody see her. Her family demanded to see her, and officers tell them that she was incapable of seeing them because she was no in no condition to talk. The Sherwood Police Department had instructed police officers and hospital staff not to permit her to talk to her family. So shortly after that, the family got an attorney. Mm-hmm. The attorney contacted the police department and told officers not to speak with the Riggs without him being present. Which we, you always know, never talk to cops. I mean, it sounds like we're criminal when we say that, but nothing ever good happens talking to cops without a lawyer. You said don't ever talk to cops. Like, just don't talk no, to No, that's them. probably good, too. Just don't talk to cops. Don't, I like cops. If you see one on the I street, like what they just do. don't say hi. It's just best not to... <laughs> Especially if you're doing a lot of bad stuff. I mean, if you're if you're doing things that you're not supposed to do already and you know it, it's probably best not to divulge that information to somebody. If but you've ever watch the show Forty Eight Hours, those detectives can get a confession out of anybody. Listen, I really believe that those are the kind of people that like are in the same group as Hitler. Not in not not in that way. You think of Let this me shut like, Keisha's mic off and she's gonna start talking about Hitler. No. <laughs> because you know, he was the kind of person that could like convince anybody of anything. Yeah, he was a great like, public and speaker. Get any information out of anyone. Like, um what's his name? Oh, what's his name? California. We're gonna talk about this sometime, I'm sure. We listened to a whole podcast on it. Abraham Lincoln? No. Charles Manson. Oh yeah. Like him, like Great speaker, could, like super personable, charismatic, like, charismatic. charismatic. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure, like these cops who can get any information out of people are the same personality type. I'm just saying, lawyer as. up. Yeah. So you got to you got to be careful if you're going to do bad things, y'all. But they tried. But detectives went into her room anyway. Yeah. They they read her her Miranda rights and proceeded to take an eight minute statement from her. Oh my god. At times, she went from crying uncontrollably uncontrollably to talking. She didn't know where she was or what day it was, was delusional and hallucinating. Riggs admitted to killing her children and explained the details of the killings together with her attempted suicide. Oh, my God. Minutes after the detectives left, the doctor came in and found her unconscious and was difficult to wake. He found that she was still suffering greatly from the effects of the drugs and was not aware of what was going on. Shortly thereafter, she was charged with capital murder of her two children and moved to the county jail. Oh my God. She pled not guilty by reason of disease or mental defect. So. Which, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean. She wasn't stable. Usually suicide, I mean. 
I can see that. A person who is mentally stable does not try to commit suicide. And kill their children. Yeah. Well, especially that, but yes. Yeah. But before her trial, Riggs had her attorneys try to suppress a statement made to the detectives on the basis that her statement was involuntary because of her drug condition and because her family had retained an attorney for her. According to her motion, taking a statement under these conditions violated her right to due process of law and right to counsel. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if any, that's, to me, that's 100% true. Yeah. The trial court denied her motion and found that after listening to the recording of the statement, there was no indication that she was hallucinating. I have the statement that I'll read some of that in a minute. It's pretty, okay. it's pretty rough. Oh, man. At her June trial, Riggs contended that, there, that she was not guilty by reason of mental defect. During her trial, she said that her life was collapsing under the weight of being a single mother. She had been arrested on a bad check charge and threatened with jail time if she issued any more bad checks. S- to me, that's almost... Sorry, the snakes got out again. <laughs> but that's almost like debtor's prison, almost. Yeah. Because people get into a spiral of writing bad checks. Mm-hmm. Then they get tossed in jail for bad checks. And then they get court fines and failure to appeal. It's just a, it's yeah. a way of keeping a man down. But she claimed that she was having trouble getting fa- child support from her child's father. She was working 12-hour shifts at the hospital, but it wasn't enough to cover daycare and other expenses. She said she had to pawn her television and VCR just to to have a birthday party for a child. No. Those her, poor babies. Yeah. She said her she was severely depressed. She also claimed that the sexual abuse that she had suffered as a child really messed with her and gave her a poor self-image. Well, of course. Yeah. Christina would not allow her attorney to put any more of a defense saying she wanted to die. The prosecutor saw Christina much different. He said, essentially, essentially, <laughs> essentially, <laughs> is, that, is that even a word? I don't think so. No, no, no. It's okay, though. <laughs> we forgive you. <laughs> what the jury saw was that she was self-centered and she viewed the children as an inconvenience and she had planned a murder for several weeks in advance. Well, of course she did. Well, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, with depression... You kind of have, what is it? Ebbs and flows. Well, and like suicide, suicidal idea, ideation, idealization, whatever, where you like, you focus on that when you're not in a good state and it just keeps adding and adding up where you just, you, you think of it as something that's going to be a, a good Instead of a negative. Yeah. A lot of people do that just in your daily life, too. Like yeah. the call of the void, they say. Like yeah. You're driving on a highway and you think, oh, well, I could just pull over into the semi and I'll be gone. Or standing on the edge yes. of a cliff and think that you just jump off. I mean, everybody kind of has a think that suicide is just a way to solve their problems. It's like the easiest way out. Yeah. And I get I'm it. Mental... I mean, I could see, you always hear people say it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem, but suicide is a problem that's a lifelong problem that people that don't have depression don't really understand. Yeah. So, I could see where this depression that she was going through. Sorry to make this a mental health episode, guys, but, you know, we understand. We're not saying that she did what was right and that she did, you know, what she needed to do, but... We understand where she was coming from and feeling that that's what. Yeah, her. her in, in feeling that way. Yeah, she's completely screwed up. But she, the detectives and the prosecutor said that she left them alone in her in the house for for hours at a time while she went out to karaoke bars. They said that she placed the interest of the children below her own. She placed her interest above the interest of the children. Yeah. So, well, pretty much saying that she put partying and having fun over the well-being of her children. Man. Which, I mean, mamas need breaks sometimes, but you don't just leave your children alone. Yeah, that age. Yeah. 
You got to, like, get a babysitter, call grandma, have them stay the night. Don't leave your children alone for hours upon hours so that you can go to a karaoke bar. Yeah. The prosecutor then played an eight-minute-long confession tape. Jesus. That described in chilling details how she planned and carried out the killings. And I think the only way for me to do this is really just read the majority of it. Uh, that way. the high points. Yeah. Or the low points. You know. Yeah. Whichever. I don't know. I, I've really covered a lot of it. A lot of it earlier, Mm -hmm. but I think I'm just going to read it. Okay. So I'll kind of paraphrase it, I guess. But first, the detectives went into her hospital room and read her her rights. And they said that, uh, let's see, let me breeze through here real fast. They asked her if she understood her rights, and she said yes. She said that that, uh, I do, and I'm sorry. The detectives then asked, do you know why, what we're investigating? Do you know what happened? She responded, I killed them. The detective said, what did you say? She said, I killed them. She said, I'm sorry. How did you go about doing that? I got some bottles and stuff. I need a cigarette. Are you saying that you got medicine from the hospital? She didn't respond. How did you do it? I gave them an injection. I tried to. I did with Justin... Because I figured he was the oldest one. He would give me more trouble. I tried it with him. I thought it would stop his heart. But it hurt. Oh, it hurt. He said it hurt so much. It didn't work. He just started calling Mama, Mama, Mama. I feared it was too late now. I had no place to turn back to. I just cleaned out my checking account and gave it all to my mother. I had to. The detective asked, why? Why did you do this? Because I wanted to die. I didn't want to die and leave my kids behind for them to be somebody else's burden. I didn't want them to think I didn't love them. I didn't want them to grow up separately with different daddies. And I knew if I passed away, they would be fighting my mother for custody, and I didn't want that. So the detective, he asked her, you felt like you were doing this for your kid? And she said, yes. The detective asked her, did you really want to die? They said she started crying. So the detective then said, and you felt it would be better if your children just die? She said again, yes. She said, how long have they been dead before you took the medicine? She said about 20 minutes. She said, that's because I drank and got up and smoked a cigarette and sat for a while. She was like, okay, I'm going to do it now. Then she wrote a note. The detectives then asked her about the timing, and she said that she gave it to them around 10 o'clock, and they were both dead by 10.30. So then she, then she told them she smoked a cigarette, and then that's when she, she uh, let's see, let me find my spot here, because this is really long. If I read it all, we'd be here forever. Yeah. Okay, let me get down here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, here's where we get back to the kids. Sorry, folks. I'm sure this is entertaining. But she said after she suffocated Justin, then she went to the daughter's room and suffocated Shelby. The detective said, you suffocated Shelby? And she said, why did you do that? So because the medicine did not work on Justin, so she didn't want her to give her any trouble. Oh, no said, what kind of medicine did you give them? Then that's when she described to the detectives that she had gave them the antidepressant mixed with water to knock the kids out. Then she suffocated them with the pill. So, let me find... Then the detectives asked her where she got the hospital and she admits to stealing them from the heart hospital. And then... She, it kind of gets where she's got some a lot of inaudible stuff. Mm-hmm. And she starts kind of talking about odd things. Uh, like, at one point, she asked if they rode up the escalator. And the hospital doesn't even have an escalator. Well, she was not... I mean, she's coming down off of this medication. Yeah. She's probably groggy. Not necessarily fully awake. 
um, you can't really expect her to be in her right mind yeah. anyways. I mean, she's not going to be coherent, but yeah. a lot of this stuff in these details, it's pretty... I mean, yeah, I mean... Like and, the detective said, she went from crying to flipping a switch and talking about it perfectly normal. Mm. So, I mean, it's it's really tough. To, uh, to me, this is a tough one. Just yeah. because what do you do? But the detectives then told her to go on and she said why that they, they just that they just kept asking why through all this because mm. these detectives they've seen a lot of stuff they seen the crime scene and i know that this probably affected them oh yeah and i'm sure they wanted the full confession as much possible yeah. information as they can get from her because they know they, need they get in trouble yeah. for asking her anything else she finally said i couldn't take it anymore i felt like i was out of control my life was just a mess and then the, she gets a lot of uh, inaudible sayings, and then she tells the detectives that people just keep getting on the elevators and escalators away from her. So the, she goes back to that odd hallucinations, I guess. Yeah. Then the detectives say that this concludes the interview, and they left the room. Which, I mean, they said that she was... She wasn't lucid. Like, she was asleep when they came back, right? Yeah. So maybe she was going in and out of dreams as well. Yeah, I mean, she was still under the effects of these yeah. drugs. And she could have very well been dreaming about it as well, and then dreaming about something else, or, you know. She took 28 of these pills. God so bless. I'm, That's got to do something to you. In the detective's research, and I guess the prosecutor, they found out that she was never a nurse at Oklahoma City. And there was no evidence of her being on the scene of the bombing or treating anybody. Wait, what? Yeah. So what? she made that up. What? So what did she do? Nothing. She was just a nurse at a hospital in Oklahoma, and she tried to use that for sympathy. Oh. Holy crap. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. So she's not a great person. No. I, but so, for some reason, I feel yeah. a little bit sorry for her, but at the same time, I also think that... She, I feel bad for anyone who has bad mental health, who isn't, you know, able to to get it, get on the right medication plan and, yeah. like, get what works for them. I, but also, you have to take your medication like you're supposed to, and... Not be a little jerk and lie about stuff. So I felt bad until here, and then I thought, "Oh Jesus!" That maybe everything that she had talked about, she was lying. Maybe she was just really manipulative, and she, she was really been. good at working people, and would like tell them Hitler? what they wanted to hear. Like what? Is that like another Hitler? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I keep bringing Hitler into it. Sorry, y'all. Yeah, apparently, Keisha talks about Hitler a lot when she drinks, so who be mine. Be mine. <laughs> There's, okay, There's actually a, a card on the fridge over there that you could probably see right now, Wes, that is from it. Tiff. And she made me a Hitler Valentine's Day oh, card one it. year. It's so cute. <laughs> it's this. Okay, give me the... I'm going to brace myself. Give no, me okay. the terrible... Well, the... <laughs> Jury then was showed photographs of her dead children in court. Oh God! Ah, uh, that to me that, whew, that'd be hard. I mean, that would that would be so hard for me to process, but I know it's necessary. That like, for I, you to get the full hmm. amount of information that you need to convict someone. Yeah, that <sighs> that to me the pictures would be over the top. You had her saying she did it. All the evidence pointed to it. Why show the dead children? But I mean, I know. But the jury, it was seven wi seven women and five men, took just 55 minutes to find her guilty of two counts of first-degree murder. Mm. They said Christina collapsed in court on receiving the verdict. The trial now moved to the sentencing phase. Christina told the jurors, I want to die. I want to be with my babies. I want you to give me to the, the death penalty. So they agreed, and I, I agree too. I mean... No, 
I'm like, don't give her what she wants. Part, part of Make me thinks her suffer. Stay the rest of her life in prison. Every, I mean, to me, that you would be your better babies. for her. Yeah. The judge also agreed, and they sentenced her to death by lethal injection. Christina thanked the judge. So, thanked the judge. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, she was still suicidal, though. Yeah. So she's like, well, it's like medically assisted suicide. 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 The execution jet date was scheduled for August 5th. These filters are not getting rid of my snakes. But, uh, it's because the snakes are something that you you just snakes and drinks <laughs> when you drink you just drag out your essence yeah, anyways when I get drinks I get snakes <laughs> she did not allow a motion for retrial oh wait God. never mind I'm sorry see the, this is the booze <laughs> the it's booze getting is finally in. hitting his yeah. system she second did, drink in she did allow for a motion for retrial Claiming that she did not get a fair trial because of her police confession. Which I kind of agree with her. That was kind of but a shitty way to do she that. she still got what she wanted. Yeah. She wanted death penalty. I think a lot of these death penalty cases are instantly appealed. Yeah. The way that works. But I think you instantly get like an appeal to look over everything, make sure everything's right. Okay. Just because we have passed where like people like Lena Baker and that little George Steiny. And a lot of people, like, well, even old Jesse Tafaro, mm-hmm. they all get railroaded and don't get an instant appeal. So, and that makes sense, yeah. But, anyway, they, they decide, let's just kill her. So, Christina was the only woman housed in the female death row at the McPherson unit in Newport, Arkansas. I had no idea the female death row was in Newport, Arkansas. I didn't know that either. That's crazy. On the way to Little Rock, you often see the sign for Newport. So we'll have to drive by that prison sometime. Yeah. We probably won't. I mean... I bet it looks a lot like a prison. I mean, you're probably going to be asleep anyways, for Mm -hmm. starters. And even if I do drive by it, it'll probably be be one of those excursions where I get lost and we drive by it and we're like, oh, hey, that was the prison that we talked about that one time on the podcast. And now we flew over a speed bump. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That happened, yeah. (laughs) Only that was at a school, not a prison. Same thing, yeah. Close enough. In prison, she had a pretty good life. Of course she did. She was allowed to watch TV. She read several books a week, which her mother sent for. And she was allowed to exercise in a small cell outside. So it's like she went from cell... To another cell, like a dog cage. Yeah. But she should be treated like an animal because she was an animal. Sorry, I I turned the hate bell on. Yeah, we need to get that hate bell, babe. Yeah, ding. But ding. She was allowed to meet with visitors occasionally. You you can really see the level of booze when it finally started sinking in on me here. (laughs) I think I went pretty good. You were doing so well. And then it's like, oh, you know what? Screw her. I'm going (laughs) to... Give me another one, Keisha. Let's kill this old hag. Because you can think that the alcohol is downstairs. Yeah, it was all the way down there, or I would have more booze. But we're anyway, almost done. It's almost yeah. refill time. This old hag actually got visitors. This old hag. Yeah. And anytime she was taken from her cell, she was handcuffed, and she got to look through a little window, like a zoo, because she was an animal. So people looked at her through this window like an animal she was can i just ring the hate bell like every single time oh, you talk yeah, now? i hate this woman <laughs> i think that her everything was a lie i mean it's very plausible yeah she was interviewed a lot she liked to talk especially about herself so that when she was interviewed she said it's so hard to deal with what she did to her children she said in my cell there's a mirror and i have pictures of my children taped to it She said, I'm eager to die. I'll be with my children and God. And I'll be where there's no more pain. Maybe I'll find some peace. Well, bitch, if there's a hell, you're going to be there. I don't completely agree, but I don't completely disagree. Because you never know. I don't know. You don't know. That's not up to us to decide. But... I definitely do not believe that she should be in heaven. 
But that's, again, not my choice, so. I'm just thinking if you're up there and you're getting judged and you're... But, okay, religion lesson. But Jesus washes away all of the sins of those who ask him for forgiveness. It doesn't matter which sin is which. All sins are created equal, right? Really? So, I mean, this is just what I've been taught. I might be wrong. I'm sure you're but... closer to the truth <laughs> than I am. But, I mean, so if all sins are created equal... I don't, I don't know. Are all sins created equal? I don't know as much as I should. Maybe I should talk to a preacher about this. But, well, you know, it's not... Well, the drive-by truckers actually have a lyric in one of their songs. I'm going to do that story later. Okay. Is there vengeance up in heaven or are those things left behind? Huh. So. Or is this like a seven, seven levels of hell? What is the well, circles of hell? Well, she would be at the bottom. How many circles are there? Is it like a tree you cut hell in half and got the rings? Booze. <laughs> there was a... Oh, we were seven both. Seven or nine circles of hell? Eleven? Thirteen? <laughs> I think that's a hotel. The hell hotel? <laughs> yeah. Gosh, we derailed the shit out of this. Anyway, she was in jail and she said it was, it was real tough when she was in county jail and with general population because none of the inmates liked her. Oh, of course not. She said they Honey. would spit on her and cuss her. They probably should have. Well, all these women were separated from their kids, and she killed hers. Yeah. She said lifelong incarceration is a waste of tax dollars and a torture for an inmate who can only live prison feet first. Oh, my God. She said she often wish it, wishes that she was only doing a 10-year stretch and that her children were still alive. I'd give anything to have 10 years if I just knew my kids were on the other side of the fence waiting for me. Of course, because you got caught. I mean, yeah. I see that she tried to kill herself. Well, and I can get it. Like, if you're in a different place mentally, like, you you feel bad for doing this. You completely regret it. You realize, hey, this wasn't me. This was the depression that killed them. Like, it was me that did it. But, you know, it was because I had... A different i had chemical imbalances balances in my yeah. body i can see being like yeah i wish that this would happen but also like you've got to admit that you're the one who did this and this is your reality yeah like, this the is rest your life of her now. life in prison would I, to me i think a lot of times people living with that in prison and solitary confinement is a better punishment than killing them yeah because a lot of these people like her welcome death oh yeah for sure. Oh, Mike Huckabee, he reviewed okay. the case, but he decided that, no, nah, just go ahead and kill her. And, you know, I, I'm with Mike on this one. I mean, I know that we just talked about that, and five seconds ago I said, let her stay in prison the rest of her life, but also kind of want her to die. So. Not shocked. Yeah. She was flown. <laughs> ding. <laughs> ding, 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 She was flown, which I thought was kind of odd. They fly from Newport to... I think it was Pine Bluff at the Cummins Prison where the death row's at. Because they don't okay. execute them in Newport. Here's the thing, though. Because if they are in a vehicle, that's a chance for them to... Escape. Or... Escape. And they could potentially hurt multiple other people other than the person just in the vehicle yeah. with them. So, if they fly them, there's less of a chance of them escaping or them hurting others to kill them. Or maybe like, just take her out back and shoot her like a... Okay, well... Continue. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Put her down. Ding. <laughs> like old Yeller. No, don't talk about old Yeller. Yeah, I know. That's, That's so sad. But after she took her plane ride to Pine Bluff, they said that uh, that was three days before the execution. The day of the execution, they said that she was calm and cooperative. Her final meal, meal. Here we go, Keisha. And yes. How you much like Last final meal. meals? I love it. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Oh, she she really picked out. She had a whole supreme pizza, a cherry limeade, and a strawberry shortcake. Okay. You and the strawberry shortcake. That's two <laughs> strawberry shortcake. She did not have whipped cream this time. <laughs> no <laughs> whipped cream. Yeah, I was kind of disappointed. Whipped cream, cream. was. <laughs> Oh my, she had a whole supreme pizza. Yeah. Like a large or like a medium? Let me see what or it like says here. Let me check her Domino's order history. Pizza. I don't know, Keisha. <laughs> <laughs> we 
when you said it, like she had like a whole like it was a supreme pizza. You don't call a little pizza pizza supreme. (laughs) I think supreme is the one that has like everything on it, isn't it? Oh, okay, yeah, Yeah, there you go. I was thinking like a big pizza. It doesn't matter what's on it. It's just big. It's going to be the supreme. Well, what it is now is stomach contents on an autopsy table. Well, true. Yeah. How long do they wait? I don't know. Before killing someone. Do they let them poop it out first? Uh, I think they make them wear a diaper. So if they do, do they? poop. Yeah. Okay. I, see, I need to know this information. Uh, I'm sorry. The movie really uh, gross, Monster's y'all. Ball. Puff Daddy. Or P. Diddy. He was in that Whatever movie, and they him. were going to fry him in the, in the electric chair, and they put a diaper on him. Oh, okay. And then that one Ted Bundy movie, they stuffed cotton balls up his butt and put a diaper on him. What? Yeah. That is insane. I don't know if it was true, but... I need to learn so much about this. Okay. There's so much research I need to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But after she ate her Supreme pizza, could be little, could be big. It's the Supreme of the coven. It was Supreme. That's, that's the Supreme. <laughs> They took her in, strapped her down, and they had a hard time finding a vein on her because, you know, she had straight potassium chloride ran through her veins. Yeah. So it kind of fucked her veins up. And they finally, after 16 minutes, got a vein. Oh, my God. And her last words on the gurney were, there is no words that can express how sorry I am for taking the lives of my babies. Now I can be with my babies as I always intended. She also said, I love you, my babies. Nine minutes later, she was dead. The potassium chloride that she had tried to run through her veins all those that years ago was now used to actually put her down. Because oh that's one of the chemicals mm-hmm. that they use. That Arkansas uses three different drugs in execution and lethal mm-hmm. injection. Like one to knock them out, one to slow their... Uh, the breathing down and want to stop their heart. Oh my so, God. and that third drug is the one that finally killed her. And the director of the ACLU in Arkansas put out a letter after her execution saying, helping her commit suicide is not what we should be doing. Well, and I do agree with that. But, I mean. But do you want somebody like her living? That's the. That's the line. I was like, I agree that prison for her would be worse, but also, I I hate her so much that I'm I'm glad she's dead. I can see both sides of that. Yeah, this is. I a, mean, I definitely would want her to suffer for as long as possible, but that's just me and my baby loving heart. But keep her in prison for twenty years. As much as she hated prison, maybe keep her there for twenty years and kill her. Yeah, that way we get both of us happy. Okay. Everybody but Christine gets happy in that one. Yeah. I don't know. I, for her to lie about the Oklahoma City deal, that... Yeah, that would piss me off, too. Yeah, that, to, that just made me think that... Because we see a lot of these people like this are really manipulative. Uh, yeah, kind of uh, narcissism. Yeah, they're They're people pleasers. Uh... uh I don't think <laughs> well, they, they're, people please are. Maybe I'm thinking sociopaths, where yeah. they, they kind of blend in like a chameleon. They yeah. tell people what they want to hear. Yeah. So she was probably doing that. Yeah. Sorry, we've had a lot of booze, so we're probably not the best well, people. Because I was be- like, people pleaser is me, and I'm not like her, but I'm also not a sociopath, so we're mm. good. Yeah. I just like to make people happy. I was, By talking about murder and yeah, ghosts. We sure to make a lot of people happy here. You're still listening. I do have a little bit of a palate cleanser story for you. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. This guy in Michigan, He it was late at night. Well, first of all, let me start back over. Okay. There, he went into this adoption agency and he saw a puppy that he liked in there. Okay. And he went to try to adopt this puppy. And they wouldn't let him because you had to pay $75 and do all this stuff. Okay. Like, so, you got mad because yeah. we were going to adopt a puppy. We tried to adopt a dog. And these people wanted $150 for me to get a dog. to walk through our house. And they wanted and, me to fill out all this paperwork. And it's, Wes is not very patient, y'all. No, I'm not. I don't I even wait for food. He is not. Mm. We do not wait for food. If there's more than a 15-minute wait, we're gone. But, yes, continue with your story, sir. But... 
they they probably wanted this guy to fill out all this paperwork, wanted them to come check out his house. So he's like, no, that's cool. So he goes back later that night and steals the puppy. What? <laughs> <laughs> he stole a puppy? Yeah, he broke in oh and stole the God. puppy. There's uh, security baby. camera footage of him taking the puppy out, not even trying to hide his face. Oh my God. That's the cutest picture ever. <laughs> So he runs out with his puppy in his arms. Oh my god. This guy really wanted a stinking <laughs> yeah. puppy. I love it. I, was like, oh, I can see that. You. I don't see this crime it. I'm all for. Steal all the puppies you want, but don't talk to the cops about it. <laughs> Maybe cover your face. Maybe yeah. don't break in somewhere. Oh, he was smiling ear to ear with that little puppy. The puppy was cute, too. But <laughs> the sad thing is they caught him because... He wasn't a very smart criminal. Like, I mean, if I was in a puppy still in mood, I probably would just go in there. Like, Give me all the puppies too. <laughs> I took a couple of cats the puppies too. You have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're gonna be those people with like seven thousand pets. It's fine. But he got caught. I I don't know if he got to keep the puppy. Surely he did. I Surely he didn't. Take that. If he went back for that puppy, I say give him the puppy. I feel like they pro. I think you say that, but I feel like they probably were like, "This man has committed a crime. He does not deserve a puppy." I think if the trial goes to the jury and they show the smile on his face when he was taking that little puppy out of there, nobody could convict him. Well, Keisha, give them uh, the recipe for all of what this beautiful, tasty drink that we had tonight. Okay, was. so basically, I made a fake margarita. Oh. Um ish drink ish listen i don't know how to bartend i just pretend like i do um let me use the google real quick and find out what i made <laughs> i thought you had it rolled out <laughs> these people can google shit <laughs> no it was an ounce of tequila half of an ounce of triple sec um and then i just filled the rest of the glass with orange juice mm. and then i put lemon juice in it and then I spat in yours. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I probably needed that. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate it. <laughs> Get me a drink, woman. <laughs> oh, dear sweet baby Jesus, please don't ever say that again. I won't. Oh, heavens. All right. Well, so thanks for listening, even though this has been a little bit uh, difficult to deal with this yeah, week. I think we got through it pretty good. Yeah. Oh, it was just a lot. Could be, I guess, that the booze death. kicked in midway, and I kind of forgot what I talked about during the first half. So. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> so. All right. Well, as always, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. That's the important You were ones. already listening to us, so I'm sure you know where to find us, but share us with your friends, Yeah, please. tell the friends. Um, we are uh, contactable. Easily contacted. <laughs> <laughs> at, um, Give us your digits, girl. Yeah. You got mine. Um, you can email us at tequilaandterror at gmail.com. Send us suggestions. Say, hey, I really liked the episode. Hey, you kind of smell. The girl was you good. Know. The drunk redneck was mildly entertaining. <laughs> really? Okay. Please rev- like rate and review us on your podcast app because the, we need more help. podcast reviews like that one. Because that was definitely my favorite. If you don't know what we're talking about, look at our uh, reviews. I think for our 10th episode, we're probably going to do a giveaway. Okay. It's like a it may be a gift card or something. If you like and share our page, we'll give you an entry. If you subscribe, we'll give you an entry. And if you review us, we'll give you an entry. And we'll throw all those names in there for a, a gift card to we'll Amazon, dis- probably. Yeah, we'll discuss it on our social media pages yeah. and let you guys know. Um, you can find us on our social media pages at Tequila and Terror Podcast on Facebook, at Tequila and Terror Podcast on Instagram, and I guess we've given up on Twitter? Uh, I think we're at Tequila Terror. Yeah, I, might find I still the don't login remember. I'm probably going to give you, you that. Yeah. Twitter, to um, me, is just a cesspool. I like Twitter. I hate it. I tweet a lot. Um, I, mostly about uh, the raccoons that live in my attic, but... I think you know. we're still planning on doing a, a show from the Crescent on Valentine's Day. If those plans could possibly fall through. Okay, not on Valentine's Day? But near it. 
close to like a Valentine's adjacent episode at the Crescent. If yeah. you guys are interested in that, let us know. And um, thanks for listening. Maybe I shouldn't have brought. I may delete that part. Okay. Just because I don't want to spill the beans on it. Okay. Yeah, I didn't think you were going to tell people about it. Oh well. But. Oh well. I probably won't. But all right. Bye. <laughs>